All right, so given we're in the lab here today, what I thought I'd do is take you through exactly what goes on with one of these. We're not gonna be talking about individual devices. This one here happens to be the Lactate Scout. There's a number of different brands on the market. But what I'm more interested in talking about today is what does it mean when the number pops up? Could be 1.2, it could be 4.6. What is that actually giving us and what does that tell us about our physiology? I think it's a really important conversation to have because these are popping up more and more. You see the pros use them. We obviously use them here in the physiology lab. But amateurs are starting to get their hands on these a little bit more readily. So today we're going to dive into what does it exactly mean when you get a number pop up on the screen after you've taken a blood lactate sample. All right, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for joining me in the lab today to talk blood lactate. I know this is a topic that has become really, really popular over the last little while. So what I wanted to do was just really give a bit of a summary of what are you actually looking at. If you have one of these devices, this one here, as I said before, is a lactate scout. Um, there are more readily available, much cheaper, to be honest, devices that are popping up all over the place now as well, um, that we're actually finding some of them pretty good. To be honest, people are just using them a lot more. So what we need to first understand is, well, what are we actually looking at when we are obtaining blood lactate data? Because it's not as obvious as what it seems, or it's not as intuitive as what it should be. With something like heart rate or power, from a heart rate perspective, when we see change in heart rate, it's a little bit easier to understand where the adaptation might have occurred. Typically, for example, and a very base look at it, if heart rate reduces over time from a training perspective, it's a safer assumption, I'm not gonna say complete assumption, but a safer assumption to say, there's probably been some adaptation from a cardiovascular system side of things, maybe more blood volume, maybe our stroke volumes increase via left ventricle size or hypertrophy left ventricle. Uh, maybe we've got more red blood cells, which means more hemoglobin, more oxygen carrying capacity in the system. All of these factors might lead to heart rate reducing over a training block. It's a little bit more intuitive. You could look at power, you could look at any of these other metrics. Blood lactate, however, isn't quite as straightforward. And the reason for that, if we go back a step first and look at fundamentals of lactate in terms of physiology at a very, very base level, I'm gonna keep this super, super simple to sort of cater for all different ranges. I know some of you who are watching might be a bit more advanced than others in terms of your knowledge in this space. We're gonna keep it super simple. When it comes down to it, lactate really, and what we're measuring in the blood, is just part of, I guess, the breakdown process of carbohydrate and glycolysis overall, breakdown of glucose or glycogen, carbohydrate. These are all the same thing. What you can think about lactate as being is, I like to use the analogy of, think about Easter time. You've got a big Easter egg that might be this big, right? I can't eat all of that in one go. Think of that as your glucose molecule. We have to break it down to be able to get the energy out. But we want the sugar in, have a bit of a sugar rush and have a great time. So I'm gonna smash that Easter egg. It's gonna break into a bunch of parts. Some parts are gonna be easily able to be put straight in. I can eat them, happy days. I'm gonna break down small enough that I can fit them in and gonna be able to consume them. Some of the parts are gonna be much larger and I'm gonna to have to break those down further. Think of those as lactate. It's just a portion of a glucose molecule. A smaller portion, take the Easter egg, smash a part of it. It's gonna leave a big chunk. I can't eat that straight away. I'm gonna to have to do something additional to it which is what lactate is. It's just a reusable component of a glucose molecule. That's sort of blood or lactate overall, 101. Then when we look at blood, blood lactate specifically, which is what these devices measure, we're looking at the concentration. So keep that in mind. We're looking at the concentration that is present in the bloodstream. We're not specifically looking at what's happening in the muscle. And that might differ because what happens in the muscle, we break down our carbohydrate, we get a bit of lactate production. Some of it's going to escape into the bloodstream because we want to take that, move it around the system and take it somewhere else. Some of it's going to escape in the bloodstream, not all of it though. So already we've got this discrepancy of at the actual source where we're generating the energy, there might be a discrepancy between there and where we're measuring lactate in the system. But it's probably safe to say in a general sense, if there is more accumulation or production of lactate going on in the muscle, there's probably going to end up being more pushed out into the bloodstream. What we then have to consider is it's not just a case of, well, we're producing more, so the number on this device will just go up and up and up. It's got to then do with how well can we remove or clear it or do something with it. But if we can move it around the system, send it elsewhere, reuse that lactate, um, the blood lactate concentration might end up staying relatively constant. So what we see with exercise intensity, particularly those who are uh, reasonably well aerobically trained, is we see they produce a little bit of blood lactate, but they can clear it quite effectively. And what that means is at lower intensities, their blood lactate's usually quite low. And this is where if you look at any elite or professional data, particularly I see it a bit here in the lab with the really fast guys, if you like, they jump on, they might be running on the treadmill behind me at 3.30 pace and their blood lactate's 1.5. Super, super low, they're flying along. 
what that is a byproduct of or a result of is yes, they're producing some lactate. We're always producing it. We always have some contribution from our anaerobic glycolysis system, which is driving that lactate production as a byproduct, if you like, or a semi byproduct. So we're always going to have some production going on, even at rest. They're just really effective. But when it does get produced, they just clear it out, reuse that those lactate uh, components as energy elsewhere and allows them to stay sustainable at those higher intensities and keep powering the workload. For those of us who can't run that fast, we have that same response. We just have it at a lower intensity because our physiology isn't that advanced comparatively. So that might mean for us it's a four minute K pace that we have a low lactate or it might be five or it might be seven minute K pace where we have that low lactate. It's gonna be relative to your individual training status, where you're at, etc. cetera. But the end result is a concentration in the blood that is the product or the end outcome of lactate being produced, take out what is being cleared, and that is what we end up with. So we end up with a number that might be, let's say, 2.5 millimoles per liter. That is our concentration metric. As a whole, though, as the end outcome of this process is we can see some changes going on when we see blood lactate start to increase. So I take a sample at very low intensity, I take it at moderate intensity, I take it at high intensity, you will see that lactate number increase. And the reason for that is because we're starting to see we're able to pr produce it at reasonable rates and we're producing it quicker and quicker. We need energy quicker overall. So we start to rely a little bit more on that anaerobic glycolysis. It's still very aerobic in the most part from an endurance perspective, but we're gonna rely a bit more on anaerobic processes, which means a bit more lactate production. And as it accumulates a bit more, if that starts to exceed our ability to clear it and remove it effectively, we're gonna start to see those numbers rise quite quickly. Initially, we'll see them very, very slow because we're sort of managing it, it's pretty okay. For most people up to about that three, four, five millimole typical range is where you start to see it accumulate really quickly thereafter. At some point, the accumulation is going to outweigh the clearance rate. Like we're just gonna need the energy for here and now. As a result, unfortunately, we just need to do it quicker. The aerobic system is can be reasonably quick, but nowhere near as quick as our anaerobic glycolysis system. As a result, we just get more lactate production. As a result, it's gonna accumulate more, accumulate more in the blood. We can't move it around the system uh, and clear it at the same rate it's being accumulated or produced. Therefore, we get these gradual builds and increases. The removal rate is probably gonna peak just before we hit uh, our lactate threshold. So uh, in terms of where things really start to dramatically increase or like commonly that's referred to as a lactate inflection point, goes from gradual increase, gradual increase to a massive big spike. Just below that point um, is where our clearance is gonna peak. Once it's peaked, we can't clear any more at any quicker rate. So as it continues to be produced faster and faster, it's gonna outweigh it. That's ultimately how we see those gradual increases over time. Because of this dynamic between production and removal or production and clearance, accumulation, etc., we then have to be really careful about what we're looking at with a blood lactate number. Sure, you can roughly assume over a period of time that if blood lactate is reducing at the same effort, for example, you do a 20 minute effort at race intensity as a 70.3 athlete, you come back and do that same effort eight weeks down the track and blood lactate is reduced over that time. Assuming you measured it correctly, there was no error in your sampling, um, you, you've pricked the finger appropriately, you, you don't have any contamination in there, and a lot of factors were equal in terms of conditions and things like that, and you had improved, you would typically see blood lactate reduce because we're just increasing that ability to clear and remove. Um, we're still probably producing a fair bit, but we're just getting better at doing something with what is left over and, and minimizing that accumulation. Uh, we're sort of matching the rate it's being produced with the removal, kind of happy days. The downside of that though is this number specifically isn't telling us, well, was it as a result of not producing more? and we're just we're still clearing it out just the same, we're just not producing as much to start with, so that process is fundamentally easier. Or is it on the other side of things where we are still producing quite a bit, we're much better at clearing. Those two could come out as exactly the same blood lactate number, and that's what it's not telling you in terms of well, how have we adapted. And I think that's where a lot of people can go a bit wrong in terms of using or trying to use blood lactate uh, throughout their training and implementing some of these numbers and, and monitoring is that if you don't have that base level understanding of the end metric you get or the number you get is a result of multiple processes sort of balancing each other out. Um, you can't necessarily pinpoint on that 2.5 millimole or three millimole alone, whatever it might be, exactly where the adaptations come from. And the reason that beca becomes a bit problematic is because that's how you might then dictate how might we change the training or adapt the training in the next block. And it might actually mislead you a little if you've misinterpreted the information. Not to say it's a bad tool. I definitely love implementing it and like using it and, and testing different scenarios to be able to see what is the response 
and looking at from a perspective of, uh, I guess, documenting over time, how is this changing to maybe start to piece some things together, but it's not as clear cut as some other bits of data that you might be able to interpret. And I think from an adaptation perspective, again, that's where you've got to be really careful on how you implement those numbers. Um, just because it's reducing, it doesn't mean we know where that reduction is coming from or why that reduction came about. We might have a pretty good idea, um, but was it because we were better at just generating aerobic energy in the first place and less reliance on our anaerobic glycolysis system? Are we just better at clearance, as I said before? So that means we're still producing a bucket load, but we can just get rid of it a bit quicker. Those are very different things. And I think that's where it can be a bit of an issue for those who aren't quite sure and just diving into this head first without really doing a bit of a background on what to expect or what to find out with some of these numbers. I think you just have to be a little bit careful. So if you do have any questions around how to implement and start using one of these, uh, or you just want to chat through some of the data you've already collected, let me know in the comments down below or get in touch with me. Nick at metsperformance.com is my email. Head over to Instagram at NJ underscore sports science. You can send me a direct message there. I'd be really interested to hear, um, particularly amateur athletes, if you've got one of these and you're an amateur athlete, how are you using it? Are you following any guidance or any protocols from, from anyone in particular? Um, have you listened to any of my stuff and that's how you got onto it? Or are you sort of diving into it without really knowing and you're sort of making that realization that you're not really sure how to use it? I'd be interested to know. Hopefully this opened up a few uh, avenues of exploration for you to continue to investigate what's going on. Hopefully I was able to shed some light on some uh, complexities around it, some of the info in behind it that maybe doesn't necessarily get talked about. Again, leave any comments or questions down below. Always happy to answer them. I'm going to leave it there for today. I've got more athletes to go test in the lab later this afternoon, but we'll catch you in the next one. Cheers. Cheers.